Yeah, what a first part of the season it's been. And there are two more days of top flight football to go then before the World Cup. Saturday's fixtures get going with Manchester City at home to Brentford before five simultaneous kickoffs at three o'clock UK time. Bournemouth against Everton, Liverpool v Southampton, Nottingham Forest taking on Crystal Palace. It's Spurs against Leeds and West Ham v Leicester. There's two great games to come later in the day as well with Newcastle hosting Chelsea and Wolves taking on Arsenal. Then two matches on Sunday, Brighton at home to Aston Villa before Manchester United travel to Fulham. And we are going to preview them all in the studio for you for the final time before the World Cup. I'm alongside former England Arsenal and Chelsea forward Leanne Sanderson and the assistant editor for The Mirror, Darren Lewis. Good to see you both. Good Last you. one before the World Cup break. And Leanne, you actually know what this is like, taking a break in the middle of a domestic season to go off and, and play for your country. What's this like for the players right now? Yeah, I mean, it's exciting times, but it's also you're a little bit apprehensive because you don't want to pick up an injury. Mm. And that's probably one of the biggest concerns for a lot of these players this weekend. I did it in 2007 when we went to China, and it was almost like, I think for me, if you think you're going to get injured, you will. So you kind of have to put that to the side. But I think a lot of players this weekend, I'm not saying they're going to be going lighter, but it is in the back of their mind. Yeah. And I don't think we've ever had this before, have we, where, you know, a week before the biggest tournament of some of these players' lives. We're still playing Premier League games. It's quite, it's quite strange, really. There's no warm-up games for players that are coming in, you know, like Calvin Phillips, played 53 minutes this season in total. And, you know, he's going to be going away to a World Cup. So, no warm-up games. No. So, I think it is quite strange. And I feel for the players quite a lot because, as well, you've seen a lot of injuries. Chilwell, Rhys James, Mane, you know, picked up an injury in Bayern Munich as well. So, it's a difficult challenge, but at the same time, you love football, don't we? And, and all the players are ready to go and hopefully all of the England players can come through this weekend unscathed. Yeah, fingers crossed. It's intense, isn't it? And it's such a quick turnaround between this weekend and the World Cup getting underway. From a journalistic perspective, you're going to be out in Qatar covering this World Cup as well. From a narrative point of view, if we think about the Premier League, it's a strange one, isn't it? Because we're almost having two separate seasons with this huge thing in the middle. Yeah, it's fantastic if you are a viewer. I mean, you were just doing the games a second ago, uh, and those games are the reason why we love this league, because all of them have their own subplot. As Leanne was saying, all, all of the focus from our industry's point of view is going to be on which players come through it and which players don't, because there is that concern. I was at Arsenal earlier today, and a question was asked to Mikel Arteta about whether players might go easy ahead of this final round of fixtures or not. And he was saying, look, there is more, there is equal chance of you getting injured if you go easy as there is if you go hard. It, that you may as well give your all in every game. And he said, look, I've had conversations with the players about this mm -hmm. because you can't afford to take your foot off the pedal. If you do, you run that risk, uh, that higher risk. But in terms of a narrative, um, there are two. One is that this is the point where somebody can really get a good feeling within their dressing room and their squad ahead of the break. Uh, and the other is, are players going to look after themselves? We'll see. But as in the ones that don't go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just going to be sat at home eating chocolate, not keeping fit. That <laughs> sounds good to me. me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, we've got loads of... Our approach is never different. It's always to, to try and set up to win. Um, Obviously, we know the qualities they've got. They're, they're an outstanding team this season. Um, nobody's really been able to stop them. Um, so, you know, it's been the final game. We'll give everything that we've got. We'll work, work extremely hard, which we have been doing the last few games, and, and see where that takes us. You know, as I say, we've got a plan, and, you know, every team has those little things that you think you can exploit, and, and that's what we're looking to try and do. I'm sure it's been high drama and high emotions for many of your players personally over the last 24, 48 hours. First of all, um, how's Ben White and just how happy was he yesterday, hmm. about 24 hours ago? I think he was very happy. I think the rest of the staff and players were so happy for him. I think he fully deserves it and, um, and you could see that um, it was a, a big moment for him. And how proud are you to have helped him on this journey to a World Cup? It's all, all the credit is down to him, what he's done. Um, if you look at his career and how, how far he's come in, in a very short period of time, it says everything about the person, the player, his ambition, and especially the, con the consistency that um, he's achieved over the last two years, I think. And has he thanked you for moving him to fullback this season? <laughs> no, we have discussed that, and uh, every player needs some time and, and understand the reasons why I think he's really enjoying it. And uh, I think it brings him 
um, other opportunities and uh, and being a versatile player, I think is something rare um, in this world. And uh, I think he's got the capacities to to fulfil that. For every hire, there's of course some people that miss out. Um, how have you had to deal with them this week? Is it has there been an arm around the shoulder of the likes of? Gabriel. I think the boys have been really good with each other. Obviously, we knew how much uh, it meant to be Gabby, um, to be selected and be part of, of the national team. But unfortunately, he didn't have the space this time. The good news is that he's really young and uh, and he will have other opportunities. And uh, you have to respect those decisions and carry on your your career. Uh, take you back to last weekend. You said the win against Chelsea gave you a real sense and this group a real sense of belief. If you end this first part of the season and your top at Christmas, how much more will that give you going to the second part? It will give great, but our focus is um, to play better every single day and uh, to try to play better tomorrow than we did against uh, Chelsea. And if we do that, our chances to win the game will increase and um, that's where our focus is. You talked after the defeat midweek about your squad being a little bit short. They always say, don't they, or certain Sir Alex Ferguson said, you buy when you're strong and you buy when you're going well. And with that in mind and your position, knowing that you can go for this title come the new year. I say that from the from day one after the transfer window, that obviously the demands of the competition that we have to be involved in are huge. And obviously um, some of the players and the experiences of those players is not the biggest, but uh, we have competed in a really impressive way up to now with the numbers that we have and of course if we can improve the team we are always going to be looking to that as a club. Do you expect to be busy in January? I don't know this is so unpredictable this window especially with the World Cup in the middle we'll have a look uh, we'll try to um, to get the squad stronger and, uh, and as we'll be active because you don't know what's going to happen in that World Cup and uh, touch wood everybody will be okay. Just finally, on the World Cup, and we're asking everybody today, so please try not to sit on the fence. Um, okay. Who's going to win? One of my players. One of your players? Yeah, I hope so. It was good again. <laughs> hey. Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> Becky, Premier League. Hi, Mikel. Uh, let's just start uh, with a squad update. Is there anything, any new injuries this week that we need to know about? No, there's nothing yet, no. Fabulous. Um, has there been any conversations for you with the players about, are they nervous, the guys that have been picked to go to the World Cup, about potentially getting injured tomorrow if they play? Has there been a conversation about that? No. We discussed that topic before and I always said to them, if you are thinking about an injury, probably it's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen today, the next day or the first game of preparation in the World Cup. So get out of your mind. You are professional athletes. This risk is always there for you. Uh, and do your job and commit yourself to everything that you do in every action and the risk will be less. That's it. And what type of game are you expecting tomorrow? Wolves winning midweek and Steve Davis' last game as Wolves interim manager. Yeah, special. Obviously, they are in a moment as well with very special circumstances. I think Steve has done a really good job looking at the games that uh, that they played. Obviously, we watched uh, the, the midweek game that they played, uh, but the game before and they lost, not really meriting to lose the game. So, we know Saturday night at that stadium, it will be busy and it will be a tough game. Mikhail, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mikhail. Do you think, um, or will it be... How would you put it? Um, if you're top going into the Christmas period, is that above your expectations from the start of the season? Have you overachieved in your own mind in the first half of the season? Well, what we try to achieve is to play better every single day. And uh, I think we are making some strikes towards that. I think the consistency level that we've shown is much better. And um, whether we can sustain that level or not is dictated game by game. And that's our aim. Already people are saying that the title race just a two-team affair now between you and City. Well, I think uh, I'm not here to to give opinions on that. What uh, I want to do is finish as high as possible and play as well as possible. How strange is tomorrow's game with the World Cup starting the following weekend in terms of people may be thinking more about the World Cup than the Premier League? Obviously, this week there is a lot of talk, a lot of rumours, uh, a lot of news, but uh, our focus has been on the game. And we know that after that, um, what is coming for some players, something um, extraordinary and special, and for others, an opportunity as well to reset and prepare. And uh, that's what we've done. You mentioned... Well, it's quite simple for Arsenal. All they need to do, regardless of Manchester City's results at lunchtime on Saturday, 
is to win and they will be top of the Premier League table heading into the World Cup break. How amazing would that be for your former club? Oh, absolutely. And I feel like, you know, people are reluctant to say they could potentially win the league. But I've said it many why times before. Why is that, though? Why don't I don't know. Because why would, what's the point in everybody else turning up if everyone's saying City are just going to win the league? I think City are fantastic. I reeled off all of their squads literally at the beginning of the show. But Arsenal, you can get a feeling about the club yeah. this year. At the Emirates, the atmosphere is different. Almost reminds me, never have I ever thought this, it would remind me of Highbury, the atmosphere at Highbury, because I used to go to Highbury nearly every week, mm -hmm. you know, when I played there, just to watch and be amongst Dennis Bergkamp and those types of players. But you can feel it about Arsenal. And I honestly believe the documentary that they brought out beginning of the season has really helped because it's shown Mikel Arteta, Granit Xhaka, unbelievable this season. Yeah. What a story. Yeah. Two, three years ago, throws down the armband, throws down his shirt and he's been, I never thought I'd ever say this, but one of the best players in the Premier League this season. Yeah. And you've got to give the manager credit. Again, patience. And you can see finally Mikel Arteta's plan coming into fruition with Odegaard, yeah. those, Jesus, you know, he's not scoring, but you can see what he brings to the team. And, you know, I think Mikel Arteta now, after they lost to PSV, he just said the better team won. Yeah. And I thought that was quite refreshing, to be honest, and not just make excuses when they lose a the game. So I, I think Arsenal are going to push City. I really do. It could come back to bite me, but I really do. And I've said it for a couple of months now because the, the feeling is there. Mm. To get to this point of the season, Darren, and, and for them to still have only dropped points in, in two matches, it's impressive, isn't it? They're a team, as you say, who probably don't want this break right now. They'd like to continue on this run. So what is the job for Mikel Arteta to do whilst most of the players are at the World Cup, but some of them are still around and they can still obviously keep this momentum going somehow? How difficult is that going to be? It's going to be difficult because the World Cup could affect lots of people physically, psychologically. You don't know what state they're going to come back in. And, and so it's going to be hard to believe that they're going to be in exactly the same place after the World Cup. And you only have to look at last season, for example, they managed to get into the, a top four position and it was theirs to lose and they lost it. You know, so you can't really count your chickens. You look at Leicester a couple of seasons ago, they were in a Champions League place before the COVID break. And then when the football restarted, they couldn't quite get that yeah. rhythm back. So, and you could argue, well, that was a longer break. But the point is that Sometimes these breaks come when you least want them. And they're such a good side. He's built a fantastic defence. He's the recruitment's been outstanding in all areas of the park. And now they've got their confidence. They're better for the difficulty of last season. I agree with you. That documentary, one of the best things they've done in years, because people needed to see the context of the success now, mm. and that it hasn't just fallen from the sky. They had to go through many low moments um, as an inexperienced side before they could get to this point where they're really strong. Could they stay in that position? I think if they were to bring in more firepower, they could. And at the press conference today, Arteta was actually asked about it. And he said, yeah, we will be having a look in the window to see what is there. We can't guarantee, but as a club, we always have to be open to it. So we'll see what happens. Very interesting. As for Wolves, they're a side who actually... The break has probably come at a pretty good time because they've just appointed a new manager, Yulan Lopetegui. He doesn't take over until the World Cup break, but he was... Here we go. Today brought to the club to meet everyone for the first time. This is almost going to be like a bit of a pre-season for Wolves, isn't it, for the players that are around? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm a bit... My only concern is that he turned down the job, didn't he, a few yeah. weeks ago, and now I wonder what's changed. Maybe they've, you know, said they're going to back him in the window. You know, it's an interesting appointment. I mean, look, he's managed some top teams, Spain, Real Madrid, Sevilla, Porto. You know, you don't manage those teams. And I think it's a good appointment, but I think Bruno Lager, when he first went in, people expected them. Yeah. to be, you know, in and around the bottom. I thought Bruno Larger did better than mm. we all expected yeah. in a weird way. I thought he did a relatively good job, but not good enough. Now, obviously, with him and Ed's not scoring, Diego Costa getting sent off and those types of things, I worry because they're very reliant upon Neves, mm. heavily reliant upon him, whereas where are the goals going to come from? And, you know, defensively, allowing Conor Cody to go to Everton, it's very strange to me, and he's on loan. How do you let a leader like that not only playing-wise, go mm. to a team like Everton on loan. It doesn't make sense to me. If I were a Wolves fan, I'd be relatively optimistic precisely because of what you just said. He turned it down, in, down initially. It almost certainly wasn't about money. I think it would have been about investment. Yeah, I think it would have been about, will I get the players I want? If I get the players I want to be successful, I'll take the job. And that must have been the thing that nudged it over the line. You look at the clubs he's been at before, he's made a good impression, and he's earned the right to be at those clubs. Mm. He's a good tactician. 
he knows good players. He's he's got good ideas about the game. He could be good for Wolves. They just need more firepower. If they get that, I think they'll be a threat. And yeah. Wolves have got good footballers. You know, you look at Prudence, mm. even Max Kilman at the back. Like they've got really good players. They back play good front, football, yeah. but they just don't have that little bit more of a cutting edge. And maybe hopefully Lopetegui can bring that in the window. Well, Brentford don't come into this match in the best of form, but Manchester City do off the back of their late win last weekend against Fulham. Going into this World Cup break, Manchester City would love to be top of the table, and we've seen this in the last couple of weeks that they've played before Arsenal. How much of a difference would it make psychologically if they are there heading into that break? Absolutely. I think the fact they play earlier as well can psychologically make a difference. But I can't quite believe that Man City are not top of the league, yeah. you know, based upon what they're doing. But I think you have to give credit to Arsenal because I don't think anybody ever saw this coming. I, didn't, I don't think Pep did, you know, having Jesus go there, Zinchenko. I don't yeah. think he saw them as any type of threat and they've helped yeah. the Arsenal team. But you look at a team like Brentford under Thomas Frank, he's done an amazing job. But I just feel like... Thomas Frank said there, he alluded to it in his press conference, you know, we have to be fearless to a yes. certain degree. You can't go there and expect to get beaten easily. But Manchester City, I mean, with players like Kevin De Bruyne, mm. what a player he is. And I, honestly, I can't speak highly enough of him. I don't think people fully talk about Kevin De Bruyne as much as we should do, even as pundits, because he's on a completely different level. Yeah. You know, his weight of passing, if he needs to pass it with the spin on it, he can do it. He's an absolute dream. And obviously, with Haaland, if he's going to play or not, but... Fair play you, to you were a striker. If you were a striker, would you then just get to a point where you just make the run and expect him to find you? Absolutely, because he can play outside of the foot pass. Even Cancelo, that ball he did this year on the outside of the foot, like they have unbelievable footballers. And I don't think I've ever seen Kevin De Bruyne have a bad day. But if he's on a bad day, maybe Bernardo Silva steps up. They have Jack Grealish. They have so many players. Foden. You know, even if they're not playing, whoever seems to go to Manchester City, and I've said this many times, they seem to get better. Akanji. Goes there, 20 plus million. No one ever saw that coming, and he's been brilliant. So that's why I think Pep Guardiola has to have a lot of credit because. Him, yeah. Exactly. And then they talk about the amount of money they've spent. Manchester United have spent more. Mm. And look at their squad in comparison. So you give him a lot of credit because Foden, Phil Foden for Manchester City, is completely different for City than he is for England. And I think it's a lot to do with Pep Guardiola. I, I, I think that's a really, really good point because we've seen many times in football history that teams or clubs have spent huge amounts of money. But they've got the wrong man in charge. City had that problem for a while because uh, for a long time they had Pellegrini in charge and he played OK football and they were really good, but they weren't great, like this great team. Um, and we've seen at Chelsea, they've spent a huge amount of money in the summer. They're struggling a little bit right now. But if you get somebody like him who improves players, who improves the culture, improves the standing of the club, who gives players the confidence to play, you can be anything you want to be, and that's what City are right now. Isn't it just great for the league as well, though, that despite the raving reviews you've just given pretty much half of the Manchester City <laughs> squad, that they aren't top of the table, and we've got this amazing title race this season. In terms of the win last week as well, we saw what it meant to Pep Guardiola. You don't normally see him celebrate victories no. like he did last week, do you? And we talk I loved about it. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. We talk about serial winners, and this is a guy that's won everywhere he's gone. Yeah. But you could see what it meant. I mean, the fact they went down to 10 players, it was almost like, I think City had over 700 passes in comparison to Fulham's 200. And, so you know, and it was fish. unbelievable. I mean, and Haaland, this the thing about this penalty, right? I know, you know, the keeper touched it, but he runs through the ball like he's already celebrating before he scored. <laughs> yeah. He has so much conviction. Yeah. And I don't think anybody ever doubted that he was going to be a success in this league. I don't think anybody ever doubted it. But, you know, Brentford... They're going to have to show up and Thomas Frank will have them fully equipped to do that. They've got Ivan Tony, who will be looking to not necessarily prove a point, but he's been left out of the England squad. I don't personally think he should have been, mm. but he'll be there trying to score goals. And Buermo, Wissa. But I, I think uh, Ivan Tony, I mean, he will. If you're Ivan Tony, would you not be... Have you been in his position before when you've been wanting to... What would your mindset be right now? Oh, you want, you want the next game to come. You're obviously disappointed, as a lot of the players will be. Ward Prowse will be feeling the same. Yeah. You know, it's a horrible phone call that Gareth Southgate's had to make, but people have to miss out. Football's always about opinions. That's why we're on this show. But at the same time, I think, you know, for Ivan Tony, he'd just do exactly what he's done for the last two seasons since he's been in the Premier League. He can score goals, not only penalties, different types of goals. He can drop deep, and he is a threat. He really is. Mm.